Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this September 2021 Speaker Series program for the Jacksonville Historical Society. I am Alan Bliss, CEO of the Historical Society. I want to thank all of our staff and especially Kate Halleck, our Marketing and Communications Director, for organizing and making this program possible. We are supported, uh, as always, by in the Speaker Series programming by Retina Associates, Drs. Fred Lambro and Bugal Mansour. We also receive support from the Cultural Council of Greater Jacksonville and the City of Jacksonville, numerous corporate, corporate partners, donors, and members like, I hope, you. Uh, if you care about Jacksonville in its past, its present, and its future, we welcome your engagement with our work and our mission. We believe that education about our city's past strengthens citizenship and that promises a healthy future for all its people. The Jacksonville Historical Society has an ongoing portfolio of initiatives that go on year round. We do a speaker series program such as the one that you're viewing this evening, every month and sometimes more than once a month. We produce a monthly educational newsletter, Jacksonville History Matters, that is included in membership for those who belong to the JHS. We offer a wide range of books and other resources on Jacksonville history and books from our inventory of relevant publications can be ordered online through our website, jackshistory.org. We are advocates for historic preservation. Each May during National Historic Preservation Month, we publish a most endangered buildings list of Jacksonville's significant structures that are under threat. Each year, we host during the month of December a beloved tradition of Jacksonville tradition, that is the annual gingerbread extravaganza, which we will host again this year at our old St. Andrew's Church downtown. We are organizing the commemoration of Jacksonville's bicentennial, which we'll observe next June, June 15th, 1822, is the date from which historians measure the establishment of Jacksonville, and we are putting together a range of, of events and celebrations, including a bicentennial publication about the city. And you'll be hearing more about that as the year unfolds in 2022. Cities only get one chance at a bicentennial, and we think Jacksonville deserves a great one. We organize and sponsor an annual Great Fire Run. That's annual since last year. That was the first annual Great Fire Run, but that happens early each May in observation of the anniversary of Jacksonville's Great Fire, one of the most significant events in the city's history. We're presently restoring our century-old Florida Casket Company building, which is on the campus that we are based on, immediately west of the Vistar Veterans Memorial Arena downtown. That's a significant project that will create an exhibition space, a state-of-the-art archive and research facility, and a performance venue on the top floor. <clears throat> I'd welcome the chance to talk to anyone further about those initiatives, and we would warmly welcome your engagement with our work by becoming a member of the Jacksonville Historical Society. I'll introduce our guest in just a moment, but a few ground rules as we get ready for that. We and, uh, and our speaker would welcome questions and comments, and you may enter those in the chat room by using the chat function through a button at the very bottom of your screen. <clears throat> I'd ask that everybody in the audience mute the, their computers, their phones, their microphones during the presentation. And now with that, I'll introduce our guest, Jada Wright Green. Jada Wright Green is the founder and president of the nonprofit Heritage Salon, the only magazine devoted to museums, historic sites and homes, and cultural institutions that are focused on African-American culture. Jada has worked with museums and art organizations since then and has been featured in publications, including the African-American Experience in African -American, in American Historic Places and Mary McLeod Bethune in Florida, bringing social justice to the Sunshine State. She has served as a keynote speaker, panelist, and lecturer on the topic of arts education, museums, and diversity at numerous conferences, universities, and museums. Recently, she became a contributor for the Huffington Post, where she shares her passion for African-American museums. 
Her awards and fellowships include the 2009 National Arts Strategies Leadership Fellow. She's a 2014 Diversity Fellowship for the American Alliance of Museums, and in 2015 was among the top 40 under 40 alumni of Bethune-Cookman University. <clears throat> she holds a BA in Political Science from Bethune-Cookman, a master's in urban and regional planning and a certificate in museum studies from Michigan State University, making her the first African-American to complete the museum studies program at that institution. And in the summer of 2015, Jada earned dual master's degrees in museum studies and nonprofit management from Johns Hopkins University. We are honored and privileged to have Jada Wright Green join us this evening for this presentation on a topic that is relevant to Jacksonville's life in the contemporary moment, its past and its future. And with that, I welcome our guest and please join me in doing so. Hello everyone and thank you for being here this evening. It's such an honor um, to be here um, to speak to you. Um, I wanna thank the Jacksonville Historical Society for inviting me along with Dr. David Jamison. Um, it's just great to be here as a product of the north side of Jacksonville. Um, although we're virtual, it's still, you know, being like at home. So I want to talk a little bit about the book and um, I'm not going to be able to go through everything because the book is over 150 pictures. But I do want to touch on several different families um, and individuals, of course, North Florida, I'll kind of go through the state. Um, but I first want to talk a little bit about myself and um, Alan here has spoken quite a bit, but I still want to talk a little bit about myself and kind of give you the journey of how I um, reach the um, point here of publishing with Arcadia Publishing um, and the book about Florida's historic African American homes. So I am Jada Wright Green, raised in Jacksonville, Florida on the north side in the Grand Park community. Um, I am the president and founder of Heritage Salon Magazine, and I will speak more about that. Um, Alan spoke about me graduating from Bethune Cookman University um, in 2000. Um, I also attended Michigan State University um, in um, East Lansing, Michigan. I graduated there in 2004 and also attended Johns Hopkins University in 2015. So um, Bethune Cummings University is really where the passion that I have for museums um, started. Um, I arrived on campus in 1995 after graduation from Trinity Christian Academy in Jacksonville. Um, immediately found my way over to the home of Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune and was eager to work um, as a um, student intern. Um, being there, I had the opportunity to meet numerous people, including Rosa Parks, Johnny Cochran, Nelson Mandela's daughter, and was able to be introduced so much about Dr. Bethune and history. Um, her life was just remarkable. She made sure people were educated, well-informed, and had opportunities to advance their life. She was truly a woman before her time and accomplished so much within her time here on Earth. She was innovative in all that she placed her hand on, ensuring all people had fair opportunities to simple things. She opened a hospital when a student of hers was not able to get medical treatment. She purchased land on a beachfront property when her students weren't able to go to the beach. She was an advisor to presidents, leaders, and many others. So being introduced to her, the college, um, her home, everything inspired me to this world of museums. And her home, the Mary McLeod Bethune Foundation, was known as the Retreat, um, built by an African-American builder um, in 1905, Mr. A.B. Raddick. It was also purchased um, by James Norris Gamble and Thomas White for her. And Dr. Bethune created it to be a foundation in 1953. The foundation was created as a place to awaken people and to have them realize that there is something in the world that they can do. So being at the Bethune Foundation, um, I was able to introduce a couple to um, Dr. Bethune's home, gave them a tour. And on this tour, they told me they were doing research. Um, later to find out that they were doing research for this book that you see here, The African-American Experience. 
And I'll get more into the book and how it actually connected me back to um, Dr. Bethune and my work. After graduating from Bethune-Cookman in 2000, um, I actually attended law school for a few semesters. Um, did not um, decide, I decided not to finish those studies and ventured over to Michigan State University where I studied um, urban and regional planning and then found historical preservation. Digging more into historical preservation, found that there was a museum studies department on campus and decided that I wanted to merge my courses from museum studies into my program for urban and regional planning. I gathered the director of all three of these programs and said, we are my advisor in the two program directors of urban and regional planning and museum studies and said, I want to do this. I want to be able to not only walk away with my master's degree, but also um, the museum studies program, which was a certificate at the time. Um, and they graciously allowed me to. And I later found out I was the first African-American to graduate from the program. During my time at Michigan State, um, completing my thesis, I decided to study African-American historical homes and the redevelopment of the Malcolm X home site. In Lansing, Michigan, which is where Malcolm X um, lived in the early years of his life, there was a home that um, his family had, um, lived in. Um, the home was eventually demolished, but there is a marker placed um, there in the area that you know, honors this home site. And so after discovering museums and historical sites in this whole field of historical preservation, I ventured and found this home site and thought it should be redeveloped to honor um, Malcolm X's memory in um, his home that he grew up in. So with this, I was awarded a research travel grant to several historical homes five historical homes actually. And pictured here, you'll see three of those homes. Um, the one on my right is the Mayor McLeod Bethune National Historical Site in Washington, D.C. At the top, the white home is Frederick Douglass um, House in um, Washington, D.C. And on the bottom left is the Maggie L. Walker National Historical Site in Richmond, Virginia. I visited those homes in order to get an understanding of their operations, um, how um, they preserve the items that were in the home. And also for me, it was just um, a fun trip, <laughs> although it was, um, you know, traveling for research. For me, my passion being historical homes and museums, it was really just a great trip for me to be able to visit sites to understand more of how they um, worked. So while at the Miguel Walker home, I located this book, The African-American Experience. Um, I picked it up and thought, this is great. This is part of my research for my studies. Um, got back to my hotel room and started reading the book and read the acknowledgement page. And as I'm reading, I locate my name as being one of the contributors to the research. This couple that I gave the tour to, um, this is the book that they were working on and I had no clue. And so at that moment, it was pivotal for me. It to me, my passion collided with that moment and it made me realize this is what I'm supposed to do with my life is study museums, historical houses, historical homes and make a difference in this field. After graduating from Michigan State, um, working while a student at Michigan State at the um, Michigan Historical Museum, I noticed I was one of the very few African-Americans working in the museum and also visiting the museum. And so I thought, what could I do to expose museums, historical sites, homes, all surrounded by the history of African-Americans? And thought, why not publish a blog um, in 2009? And in 2012, officially it became a magazine um, that um, also became a nonprofit. And it's truly the first publication of its kind, no other um, in the world, um, that talks, you know, directly to the African American museum culture. In 2015, um, I um, completed my studies with Johns Hopkins University um, and also a certificate in nonprofit management. Um, from 2004 up until that time, the museum field changed dramatically. 
And I wanted to be able to truly um, craft my skills and went back to get the master's degree, which was great. I learned a lot and learned how the museum field just changed so much within a decade. So after that time, I began to, on my own, just outside of my work and as a mom and a wife, um, started to um, research historical homes throughout the country. All over the United States are homes that have been preserved or in danger of being, um, you know, demolished. Um, historical homes. And so I knew that I wanted to publish a book about historical homes and just not for sure how, but <laughs> knew I wanted to do it. And so um, in March 2020, I approached Arcadia Publishing about a book project um, about historical homes. Um, and Arcadia Publishing has guidelines you must um, have at least 128 pages, um, historical photos, um, and, you know, pictures that come from historical societies, libraries, museums, archives. They publish regional books. And so after, you know, doing this research, and really, truly, when I, I look at what I've done um, from 2003, from my master's degree up until, you know, at this time, I research all these different homes and places across the country. So they said, well, we typically do regional books. Is there a certain region or a certain area that you could pinpoint? And I chose Florida. Well, why Florida? Well, of course, it's my home. It's where I grew up. Um, and actually, it's where I had located the most amount of homes. And the connection, the connection of you know, volunteering at the um, Dr. Mary McLeod Bethune's home, that is where the passion um, really began for me. Um, so it just made so much sense for me to just, you know, have the book focused on the state of Florida. So here is the cover photo. Um, this photo was captured by Gordon Parks. Um, on a Sunday afternoon, Dr. Bethune was walking to the chapel, which is located on the campus of Bethune-Cookman. In the back of the White House, you see, um, is her residence. Um, and Dr. Bethune is wearing her famous um, pearls, her purse in her hand, and her cane. And so with Arcadia Publishing, you don't necessarily, you're not able to choose necessarily your cover. And so I wanted to ensure that I was able to pay homage to um, Dr. Bethune and plant my case to the publisher and said, listen, this is the house that started this. If this house was not in existence, if this woman was not here, I would not have written this book. So the fact that I can honor her and her legacy and place the home that um, really started this for me on the cover is just amazing. And they thought, of course, it would be a great idea. And here we have the cover photo of Dr. Bethune. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the people throughout Florida that were very instrumental um, and that are, you know, in the book um, and people that I'd never heard of um, that really were remarkable in all that they did. Here you have A.L. Lewis, Abraham Lincoln Lewis, um, who relocated to Jacksonville, Florida around 1876. He and six other prominent African Americans founded the Afro Life Insurance Company. He eventually became president of the company, and it was recorded that he was one of the first African American millionaires in um, Florida. During the period of racial segregation, Blacks were barred from most of the beaches in Florida. And Lewis realized the Blacks needed an opportunity to have a place of relaxation and reprieve. And he desired to create an oceanfront area along the Atlantic Ocean for Blacks during the Jim Crow era. Over 200 acres of land was purchased, and Lewis called the community American Beach. His house is pictured here on the right-hand side. Um, and his house was actually the first home that was construct constructed on the beach. And A.L. Lewis is pictured here on the left-hand side. Most of you may know about the Sugar Hill neighborhood that's um, located on the north side of Jacksonville. Um, this was an area where wealthy 
Blacks live. Um, very stately mans mansions. Um, and A.L. Lewis' home, which is pictured here, um, it's his residence that was in the Sugar Hill neighborhood. Um, and eventually it was demolished along with um, several homes, although there are some homes that are in the Sugar Hill neighborhood that are still um, standing to this day um, in Jacksonville. Um, but this is A.L. Lewis. So he had two homes. He had literally an, a beachfront home as well as a home in, you know, proper Jacksonville city limits. Now, the La Villa area um, was an incorporated town for newly freed Blacks um, after the Civil War. It operated as a town for several years and was annexed with the city of Jacksonville. And here you have a picture of a cabin around 1870. Um, but the La Villa community was known later on as a tight-knit community, um, had a booming economy where people from all different backgrounds lived, and about 70% of the residents were Black. The Davis Street's home is photographed here, and they were shotgun homes. Uh, and that was a typical residence in the 1940s. And this area was located near the um, Sugar Hill neighborhood. Next, we have Frank Butler. Um, he um, was um, a real estate um, agent, business owner, and a resident of the Lincolnville community in St. Augustine. As a successful um, businessman, he owned a market and picture here. Here is him in his office um, in St. Augustine. He was also active in politics, civics, religious activities all in the community. He owned two residents, which was one in Butler Beach and also in the Lincolnville community. So Butler Beach was purchased by Frank Butler on Anastasia Island. It was the only stretch of land between Daytona Beach and American Beach in Jacksonville, and it was designated for Blacks. Photograph here are homes along Butler Beach, um, homes, bathhouses, and businesses that were all owned by Blacks were constructed in the area. Um, a woman that I wanted to make sure that I point out was Dorothy Nash um, Tooks. Um, she owned and operated the Tooks Hotel. Not only that, she was also an educator um, and a principal um, for elementary school. So from 1948 to the mid-1980s, famous Blacks, including James Baldwin, were guests at Tooks Hotel. She transformed her house into a hotel so that Blacks would be able to have a place to live. I mean, I'm sorry, to reside when they traveled. Picture here is a photo of Nash um, greeting guests at her son's wedding. And if you look there in the left-hand cor corner of the photo, you will see a neon sign in the yard. She was the first business um, in the area to have a neon sign. So she was always innovative in what she did there. Um, and her um, hotel, the home she transferred into a hotel, is in the Tallahassee area. L.B. Brown here, um, pictured to my left, is um, a former slave who became a successful businessman who owned property and built between 50 to 60 homes that he either rented or sold. His home that is pictured here on my right um, had five bedrooms, a living room, dining room, kitchen, and bath. The foundation of this house was built upon 18 tree logs that were over 100 years old. The residence was renovated in the 1990s, and picture here is the house, um, more of an up-to-date photo. Um, it's probably one of the um, houses in the area that, in the Florida um, area, that has been preserved so well, and there's a man that is been working diligently to make sure the house is in great condition um, in the Bartow area. Ybor City um, is located in the Tampa, Florida area and was settled by Afro-Cubans. Pictured here is a group of Afro-Cuban um, men. Um, this photo was captured around 1885. Today, this area um, is home to several cigar lounges, 
um, a very famous Colombian restaurant that has great Cuban food. I've actually um, visited there, um, ate there. Um, but this area is very popular now with young people and still has quite a bit of um, cigar areas and lounges. The Central Avenue District is located in Tampa, Florida. This was a bustling, thriving community that was um, full of Black-owned businesses, beauty stores, barbershops, beauty salons, entertainment were all um, very um, popular businesses and things happening in the area. This is where Blacks enjoyed music and dancing, um, where, because Blacks were not allowed to shop and go to different places, this is the area that they were in um, and where they were successful in all that they did. So Garfield Rogers um, arrived in the Central Florida area around 1905. He's pictured here on the right-hand side. He worked as a tailor. He owned a dry cleaner and received a license to sell real estate and actually um, was a mortician, him and his wife. <laughs> they also um, helped create the Tampa Central Life Insurance Company. He also opened the Rogers Hotel, the Rogers Dining Room, that was on Central Avenue. And picture here to my left is his home um, in the Tampa area. He also was an investor for a resort for Blacks um, in Florida. Elder Jordan came to the St. Petersburg area and became an entrepreneur by selling produce and eventually began buying property throughout the St. Petersburg area and basically became what we know today as a developer. So with his purchases, he purchased um, a track of land um, and he eventually donated that track of land in order for houses to be built for Blacks in the community. Here is a photo of when they were first built called the Jordan Park Homes. Not only did he donate the land, he also advocated for a elementary school to be open for black children, which opened in 1925 and is named Jordan Park Elementary. He also established a bus line and a beach for African-Americans through segregation. So now we're gonna go down South Florida um, to Miami. Um, this photo is from the Overtown community of Miami, which was established in 1896 and was originally called Color Town. Again, another tight-knit community that was established by um, Blacks from different income levels, all living together within a neighborhood. In the 1900s, the Overtown area was just another booming area, grocery stores, churches, schools, even a drugstore in the area. The home that is pictured here are um, one of the very well-kept homes. As you can see, there are potted plants, rocking chairs on the porch, um, and all these three-room frame structures um, were homes that Blacks lived in, and how convenient was it for the grocery store to be across the street? And, and uh, the area that, of course, loved Jacksonville, but really fell in love with the Overtown area because the um, pride that the people took in their homes, although these weren't stately mansions, you can see by the families adding flowers and a rocking chair and the tidiness of their, of their home, how much they took pride and care for their home. Here, the last um, family I want to talk about is Dr. William and Mary Lou Lewis Chapman. Um, Dr. William Chapman was one of the first Black um, physicians in Miami, um, and he was known to be working with infectious disease. This is his wife and himself pictured here. Um, they lived in a two-story home that served as not only their residence, but also um, their, his office. The house is currently on the grounds of a high school in Miami called Booker T. Washington High School. Um, I lastly want to just give honor to Ms. Altonese Barnes, who wrote the foreword to the book. She really was instrumental um, and has been in sustaining the history, museums, and historical sites throughout Florida. 
Ms. Barnes founded the John G. Rowley Museum and Home, which is in Tallahassee, Florida in 1996. She served as an executive director then, um, and in 1997 established the Florida African American Heritage Preservation Network, which is a statewide professional museum association, historical sites, homes, all um, that really um, are under this umbrella and work together to sustain themselves to make sure that they are around for, you know, for years to come. And so she wrote this beautiful forward and said, I view this publication as a blueprint of remarkable structures that spark emblems of life and how it was lived by African Americans from Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and through the Civil Rights era. So that's just my last slide. Um, this is my Facebook, Instagram, and website. And if you would like an autographed copy of the book, you can find it here at jadawrightgreen.com. It's probably time to say thank you very much to Jada Wright Green for sharing this account of her experience, her research, her journey, and her new book on African American homes in Florida, a welcome addition to the literature on homes and housing and the lived experience of people in this state. It adds to and reinforces the notion that Florida is a very complicated place. Each community in the state is much more complex than we tend to think of it as being. And I really appreciate your taking the time to share that with us, our membership and our audience. I'd like to thank everybody in attendance and participation for joining us uh, for your courtesy and engagement. And I invite you to visit our website, www.jackshistory.org for information on forthcoming programs and the other activities of the Jacksonville Historical Society. With that, I'd say thanks again to everyone. Stay safe and healthy, and good night to all of you.